Um, so thank you very much to Edelog and to the organizers for inviting me to talk today. So I, I realize I'm the last person standing between you and lunch, so I promise I'll do my best to be brief. Um, so this paper is a little bit different from other presentations that we've listened to so far, which have been mostly about countries and regions, right? And this paper, as the title suggests, is going to be a bit more about the micro level, about managers and about firms. But the motivation is um, very much at the aggregate level. So it's going to speak very much to the issue, issues that we've been talking about here. It's very much about the relationship between education and development. And for a country like Portugal that has invested so much in education over the last few decades, this is obviously um, a very big issue and an issue that has raised some level of frustration that has also come up in some of the presentations that we've heard to. So I hope, I think I'll be able to offer um, a slightly more optimistic view, at least about the long term. So having said that, let's get started. So research about um, the relationship between education and development started with a picture that looks more or less like this. So on the y-axis here, we have GDP per worker. And then on the x-axis, we have the average years of schooling of the population of that country. And so we see that the relationship is very strong, right? Um, up there on the top left, we have the slope of the regression line. So what that tells us is that for each year of extra schooling on average, GDP per worker goes up by about 30%. So that's, that's a very high number. And if you believe in the importance of education for development, this is very good news. And in fact, education by itself can account for about two thirds of the variation in GDP per worker that you see in this graph. So this is a very positive message, but of course this is just a correlation, right? So it doesn't really tell us what the causal effect of education is on development, and this correlation has been challenged on those grounds. And so the main challenge has come from this second picture, or pictures like this. So this is exactly the same thing, but at the individual level within countries. So this is the example of Portugal in 2009, and we have individual earnings on the y-axis, we have years of schooling on the x-axis. These points are averages for all the workers in Portugal at each level of education and the earnings that they have. And we have a regression line which also sl slopes upward, so in a sense the relationship is also strong and positive. The key difference is the slope. The slope in this graph is much lower than the cross-country slope. It's just 10%. And although this represents Portugal in 2009, it's actually fairly representative of what you'll find if you look at other countries and other points in time. So typically the estimates that people have found range between 6 and 10%. So Portugal is on the high end of that scale, but this is fairly representative of what you'll find elsewhere. Um, now, this is also just a correlation, same thing as the cross-country graph, but in this case, there's been a lot of research on what the causal effect actually is. Lots of different methodologies, and it turns out that that effect falls more or less in the same range, right? So people have looked, for instance, at samples of identical twins with different levels of education. People have looked at changes in compulsory schooling laws that move education across different cohorts and what happens to earnings. People have looked at discontinuities in college admission rules and what um, students that are just below the cutoff and just above the cutoff, what happens to their earnings. And the findings are pretty consistent, right? There's substantial agreement among labor economists that the return to education falls more or less in this range of six to 10 percent, right? So what does this imply for the aggregate effect? There are basically two views that are hotly debated. The first one is that the, the aggregate effect is actually very likely to be similar to the individual effect, and so much lower than the cross-country picture that I showed you in the beginning. And so the, what's the story there? Well, more developed countries that have higher levels of education also use much more advanced technologies in production. And it's actually these advanced technologies and not the education that is driving most of the effect. And by education here, um, I mean, this, the economist's notion of technology, or sorry, by technology, 
I mean, the economist's notion of technology, which is a very broad notion. It's basically anything that affects the efficiency with which inputs are used in production. So things like labor and capital. So this is not just uh, technology in a strict engineering sense, but it could be organizational processes, could be management practices, anything that affects that efficiency. And so the story is that those technology differences are really what, what matter here. If we hold the technology differences constant, then our standard model, standard assumptions, imply very strongly that the two effects, the individual effect and the aggregate effect, should be the same. And since we have much more compelling evidence about the individual effect, and that it, you know, it's around 6 and 10 percent, that should also be our best guess for what the aggregate effect really is. And so this view is actually the prevailing view in development accounting, in growth accounting. And yesterday, we were talking about the, the size of the residual when we're trying to understand sources of differences across countries. And these computations that find a very large residual basically take this view. So they assume that at the aggregate level, the contribution of education is going to be somewhere between 6 and 10 percent. So this is one view. But there's a second view, um, which is that the aggregate effect is actually likely to be larger, substantially larger perhaps, than the individual effect. And once again, there are two stories there, mainly in the literature. One is that this higher cross-country coefficient reflects human capital externalities and not technology. So what are human capital externalities? It's basically the idea that my productivity as a worker is going to be higher the more educated the other workers around me are. And since this is going to affect everyone's productivity, it won't show up in relative income, but it will affect everyone's income equally. It will show up in the aggregate effect. So this is one story. The problem with this story is that the evidence is really not very convincing. There are conflicting studies. Some of them find that externalities are high. Other studies find that they're low or even non-existent. And there's really no agreement on what their magnitude really is. So this basically reflects the difficulties of doing these kinds of studies at the aggregate level where education is co-varying with a lot of other things. A second story, and that's the story that I'm going to focus on today, is that yes, technology differences do play the key role, as the first view argues, but these differences are themselves driven by education, and namely by the education of managers that are making these decisions about what technologies to apply in production. Right? And so because these differences are driven by technology, you don't need to hold them constant. They're part of the effect of education. And that's going to explain why the aggregate effect of education is going to be larger than the individual effect. So I'm going to be focusing on this second story and sort of testing this as a hypothesis. So let me elaborate a little bit on that. So this, the, the, this hypothesis was first introduced in a paper by Nelson and Phelps in 1966. So I'm going to use their own words. They say, we suggest that production management is a function requiring adaptation to change. This is the key point. And that the more educated a manager is, the quicker will he be to introduce new techniques of production. This is the basic hypothesis. Now, how do we go about testing this? There's an immediate problem, which is technology, although it's a simple, nice parameter in the models that economists use, is very hard to measure in practice. Right? What is the level of technology for a country is not something that we can readily translate. So Nelson and Phelps were aware of this, and they proposed an implication that results from their theory, which is actually observable. And that implication is that econo economic growth, so not just the level of GDP, which is what I showed you in the first graph, but the change, is going to increase with the level of human capital. So it's a relationship between growth and levels that is specific to this theory. And so this was put to the test in a paper by Ben Habib and Spiegel, and they did find support, strong support for this prediction when they look across countries. This does hold up. But the problem again is, if you were not convinced about this to start with, then again, this is an aggregate relationship looking across countries. And you can easily tell stories about why this relationship would hold for other reasons. So for instance, yesterday, we were talking about the importance of institutions. So suppose that a country with higher level of education also has better institutions. Maybe that those institutions are what's driving 
the economic growth and not the education. So again, we have a test at the aggregate level and it's very hard to isolate variation in education from other things and so it's really not convincing to people that we're skeptical to start with. So where does this paper come in? So the idea is to take the discussion from this aggregate level where it's been so hard to make progress and bring it to the micro level, which is incidentally the level at which people have studied individual earnings and education and they've made so much progress because it's easier to do that kind of progress at the micro level to isolate the variation we're interested in than to do it at the aggregate level. So what I do is I take this hypothesis and I translate it to the level of firms. So I just, I develop a simple model, a standard model, which I'm not going to present. And I show that if manager education is in fact a driver of technology, then it's going to increase firm growth, right? So the parallel here is obvious. You have at the aggregate level, country growth or economic growth and the level of education. Now I'm talking about firm growth and the level of education of the managers. The same test done at the firm level, right? And so then I go and test it. And in the spirit that John just mentioned, I'm going to use local data from, from Portugal. Um, and it's actually very, very useful data for this, for this purpose. It's a, it's a data set called Quadros Pessoal, which I, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. It's very rich data about firms and about workers that is um, actually fairly unique even at the global level if you want to study these kinds of issues. So it's a very useful data and we're very lucky that, that we have it here in Portugal. So I do three things. First, I just look at the cross-section of firms. Just looking, you know, comparing firms at one point in time and over time, does this hold in the data? It turns out that it does. So firm growth increases strongly with manager education across firms. And this holds controlling for a lot of firm characteristics. So that's the first step. But of course, you could still make similar arguments about omitted variables uh, and other factors driving this relationship. So maybe it's something else about the firms. Maybe it's the sector they're in. Maybe it's where they're located. So to sort of address these types of concerns, I look inside firms. So I look at changes in management within the same firm. So this is holding all of that constant, only the manager changes. And I see what happens then, and I'll show you that you find a very similar effect. And then second, you might argue, well, maybe it is the manager, but maybe it's not the education. Maybe it's something else about the manager, right? This is the third, third level of concern you might have. Well, I think there's not, you know, the, the, the research on individual earnings and education has shown us that bias from these types of abilities is unlikely to be significant, so I don't think this is a major issue. But I also develop a strategy to account for this possibility that there's omitted ability and other characteristics of the manager that I observe, I control for them, and I also show you that the effect doesn't change much. So this is the empirical part at the micro level. And then there's a third part which is still ongoing, but the idea is to take these estimates and bring them back to the, to the macro level, to the aggregate level that we're interested in to see what they really imply for the effect of education across countries, right? So the goal here will be to say what is the coefficient that is implied in that initial graph from these results. I'm not there yet, so I won't present that today. But what I have is a simple exercise um, as an example of what the impact could be, which is taking the model that I developed in the first part calibrating it with the results that I have from my micro-based um, estimates and simulating what would be the effect in Portugal of switching from the distribution of manager education we have today to the distribution of manager education in the United States and seeing in the long run, once the effects all play out, what would be the effect on aggregate output. So this is what I'm going to show you today. Okay, so just quickly start by talking a little bit more about the data. I think a lot of you already know this, but so this is an administrative matched employer-employee data set. It covers the universe of employer firms in Portugal. So every firm that has at least one employee is going to be represented here. I'm using the period from 1995 to 2009. There's actually more recent data now, which I'm hoping to incorporate in the future. There are two key advantages in using this data that I think are very interesting even internationally, as I said. One is that on, on the worker's side, 
we actually have these codes that identify the managers directly. So this is a big issue when you're doing research in this area. We don't really know what people do inside firms. In Portugal, we actually have these classifications. We know exactly who the manager of the firm is at each point in time. And then the second thing is that this is not, this is not a sample. This is not a survey. This is the universe of firms. It covers every single firm from the point of entry and it actually registers the date of incorporation. So we can actually follow the firms from when they're created and over time. So in terms of key variables, I'm going to look at firm growth. As I said, I'm going to focus on employment. It doesn't really depend on that. The results are the same if you look at sales, if you look at value added, I'll, I'll show you some plots of that as well. Manager education, I'll look at average years of schooling from no schooling to college. So basically until the level of licenciatura. I think it would be very interesting to look at masters and PhDs and it's now possible to do that and it's something that I'm hoping to do in the future. And then I'm going to use a series of controls which are going to be firm age, size, manager age, non-manager education, age, number of managers, so a whole host of other firm characteristics that I'm going to hold fixed whenever I do these comparisons. So finally, you know, in terms of a sample, so you see the kind of power you can get from using this data set, there's 1.8 million observations and 350 9,000 firms, so it's a very powerful data set. Now conceptually, how do you define the managers? I'm just going to go th through this quickly. The idea is to identify who the top decision maker is. So obviously managers at a very small firm, at a very large firm, might do very different things. There are different levels of management. My focus here is who, who is at the top at each organization. How do I define that? Well, there's different managerial titles that the data use. I pick the highest one. It's, that's the, the simple approach that I do. And then I do some, I'm, I don't want to describe this in a lot of detail, but basically I add a few rules to maximize the coverage of the data. So if the firm doesn't really um, report anyone as a manager, then I take the owner of the firm to be the manager. If they don't report any owner or manager, then I look to see if they already had a manager in the previous year or if they have a manager in the next year and I interpolate that. So just a simple way of maximizing coverage and I get to about um, so about three quarters of the observations in the data are covered that correspond to 87% of employment. So it's a very comprehensive definition. I've tried many different ways of, of defining these managers and the results end up being very, very, very similar. So just to give you some descriptive data on what the education of these managers looks like in the data, I'm plotting here the percentage of managers at each level of education. So you have the different levels of the Portuguese education and then in parentheses the number of years of schooling that that typically corresponds to. And then I'm plotting those numbers for 1995, the first year in the sample, and 2009, the last year. And this shows something that we all already know, right? There's been tremendous progress in education in Portugal. In 1995, 40, over 40% of managers had four years of schooling, right? So this, you know, this number is very, very striking. Fortunately, it's gone down a lot. It's still significant, but it's now under 20%. And then at the other end, managers with a licenciatura were 10% in 1995, have now doubled to 20%. So the trend here is, is obviously very good. And if this turns out to matter a lot, these are good news for the long term. Second thing that I also wanted to show you, I'll, I'll show you later some results that that use this is what these managers have studied if they did go to uh, college, right? So the types of degrees, I've grouped them here in these buckets. So humanities, and that includes social sciences, then business, science, engineering, health-related degrees, and then other, which is mostly degrees that are not reported. So that is an unknown category which dominates that other um, group. And so here the differences are not so marked perhaps between 1995 and 2009. I do want to highlight a big increase in the, in the share of uh, science, managers with science-related degrees. So again, if, if, if this story about technology is, is really playing a role here, this also could turn out to be uh, very good news. So in terms of the sample itself, so now looking at the level of firms, this was managers, now looking at the level of firms, what does that look like? These are some summary statistics, averages, standard deviations, some percentiles. I'll just highlight a few numbers. The first is that the average number of workers per firm is just under 14. So these are small businesses. You should have in mind 
a typical small business, not a large corporation, right? And looking at the universe of firms, the sample is dominated by small businesses. The median firm over there has just five workers. And then the second thing is the level of manager education. I mean, I already showed you some numbers, but just to show you the average across the entire sample, it's under the ninth grade. So it's actually, you know, it's very low when we think of um, a top decision maker. Uh, they typically have very low, very low schooling over this period on average. The standard deviation is 4.3, so that's quite high, and it really shows us that these numbers have been changing a lot. That generates a lot of variation, which is useful if we want to study um, these effects. Okay, so moving on to findings. So this is, I'm going to go through a series of steps. Um, this is the simplest one. So here I'm just going to take all the firms in 2009, I split them into groups based on the level of education that the manager has. And then I plot the average size of these firms at different ages. And so this first group are firms that have managers with between zero and six years of schooling. And you see that for this group, young firms start with around five or six workers, and then older firms are not much larger than that. So even firms with 30, 40, 50 years of existence, they're still fairly small, right? Still basically under 10 workers. If you do the same for the next group, so firms with managers with between six and nine years of schooling, the difference is a bit higher, right? They start around the same size, but then older firms are significantly larger. If you add the next group between nine and 12 years of schooling, the difference is even a bit higher with, for, for firms with managers between 12 and 15 years of schooling, still a bit higher. And then finally, if you add the firms with the highest educated managers, so this is a group with managers with 15 or over years of education, the difference is really large. So they still start out all more or less at the same size, right? Firms at entry are essentially the same size. And then over time, or much older firms are much larger. So I want to emphasize that this is not a plot about growth yet, right? This is comparing the different firms at one point in time. But it is suggestive that firms with the higher level of education for the managers grow a lot more over their, over their life cycle. And this, these differences are really large. If you compare, say, 40-year-old firms for the top group with entrants for the same group, those firms are about 12 times larger than the entrance. The older firms are about 12 times larger than the entrance. If you do the same comparison for the bottom group, so for ma firms with managers with between zero and six years of schooling, the ratio between the 40-year-old firm and the new firm is below two. So the difference is really, really large. Right, now there, this is sort of in a nutshell the, the story, and I think it's very, very consistent with the prediction now I'm going to go through a series of steps to test whether this actually holds, um, whether this actually really is driven by the education of managers. So first thing, this was employment. As I told you, you can look at other things. This is revenue, and the picture is going to look exactly the same. You can look at value added, and the picture looks exactly the same. It doesn't really depend on what measure of size you end up using. The second thing is you can do the same exercise but splitting firms by average non-manager education instead, right? So I was using managers, now I'm using non-managers. And here the picture is much less clear, right? If anything, firms in the top groups, so 12 to 15 and 15 plus, start out smaller, and then they converge over time, and there's no clear pattern um, for older firms. So this seems to be specific about managers and not about other types of workers. The second thing is, well, I was just showing you different firms at one point in time. Maybe those firms that are much larger and have more educated managers, they grew before and then hired the more educated managers. And it has nothing to do with the education of the managers, right? So here I address that. So here, instead of looking at different firms at one point in time, I take the oldest cohort of firms that I observe in the data, so firms that were created in 1995. I sort them by the education of the managers at age zero, and I forget about their education later, and then I plot their size over time. And the pattern is exactly the same. 
If anything, it's even smoother. Um, so it in, there's a monotonic increase in, in, in growth over time. And if you actually compare the ratio of firms in the top group, so the 15 plus group, the size relative to the size of the bottom group, the zero to six group, the ratio there is about 2.5. And if you look at the first picture I showed you at the same age, it's the same, it's very similar. So again, these pictures are very consistent. So this is one issue. Another issue that you might have is, well, these are survivors, as the title says. So maybe the more educated managers are just taking riskier strategies that if they work out, they grow a lot, but there's a high chance of failure. And so in expectation, they wouldn't be so different. So this shows you that that's also not true. So this is plotting survival rates. So all the firms that were started in 1995 and the fraction that survived for each group over time. And you see that if anything, firms in the top group, the 15 plus group, are also more likely to survive. And then among the other groups, there are really no, no meaningful differences. So it's not really explained by differences in risk taking. And finally, another, another sort of idea you might have is maybe this is explained by a small number of superstar firms, right? I was showing you the, the mean. The mean can be very affected by outliers in the right tail. So this picture shows you that that's also not true, right? This is plotting the entire size distribution for firms in the bottom group, the zero to six group, and then the size distribution for all firms in the top group, the 15 plus group. And you see that the difference in size is driven by a shift in the entire distribution. There's a mass of mid-sized firms in the 15 plus group that really explains the difference in the average. This is not about superstars. Okay, so this sort of concludes the first part where I told you I was going to look across firms. Now, as I said, one issue that you might worry about is maybe these firms are different in ways that we can't really observe. So now I'm going to look within firms. What happens when firms change managers? So that holds constant everything about what the firm does, what changes is the manager. And I do this in two ways. The first one is I compare firms that switch to college educated managers with firms that switch to managers with high school or less, controlling, so holding fixed, their initial level of education and a series of other characteristics that I showed you before. So these firms are going to look the same before the change and then they change to different levels of manager education. What happens to their growth afterwards? That's the question that this is asking. So the assumption there is, is a typical differences in differences assumption that these firms would have followed parallel growth trends in the absence of these changes. And we can get some indication of that by looking at what those growth trends were before the changes, right? If they looked the same before, there's a good case they would have remained the same after if the change hadn't happened. So I do some, some additional tests. Besides that, I do the same approach but restricting the sample to firms that were owner managed both before and after the change. So these are likely to be family firms where the change is likely to be driven by family ties and not so much by selection of, of managers into firms. And I do some placebo tests with changes in other occupations. That means doing exactly the same, but looking at firms that change education in other occupations and what happens to growth then, right? So that kind of will tell us whether this is really an effect of managers or maybe something else is going on that applies to every kind of worker. Still, you might worry about selection issues in the first approach. So I have a second approach that really focuses on plausibly exogenous management changes. So the idea here is looking at firms that lose college educated managers versus firms that lose managers with high school or less. And I focus on losses where, where these samples leave the sample, sorry, where these managers leave the sample permanently before age 55. So what's the idea here? Because I have the universe of workers, if someone drops out permanently from the sample, then there's a very good case that they left the labor force entirely. And if they do that before age 55, which is the minimum retirement age, again, there's a good argument to be made that they left for reasons that have nothing to do with what is happening at the firm. They're exogenous to the firm, right? So that's the goal here. And what are reasons that we could be talking about, death or disability? Um, and so just to sort of give a simple sanity check over the plausibility of this, I calculate what would be expected in terms of deaths given the demographics of managers that exit. And that calculation can account for over half 
of these exits that I, that I observe. So I think it's plausible that these exits have really nothing to do with, with what's happening at the firm and are close to sort of a natural experiment that we would like to observe. So these are the results from the first test. So what you see here is that firms look very similar before the management changes. So the blue group are the firms that change to a college-educated manager. The red group, firms that change to a manager with high school or less. They look the same right before the change happens. And then once the change happens, growth for the firm that switches to the more educated manager jumps up and stays higher over time. Right? So sort of an immediate jump stays higher over time. Very consistent, I think, with, with the idea that we're trying to test. The sec or actually, before getting to the second design, this is the idea of restricting the analysis to firms that were owner managed before and after the change. And you see similar results, the only difference being that the change in growth only happens in the year after the new manager gets started. But there's still a significant change in growth, not much of a difference in trends before the changes happen. And then these are the studies using other occupations. So the exact same methodology, but instead of looking at changes in manager education, looking at changes in different, profession, different uh, occupational categories. So professionals, office workers, service workers, blue collar workers, these are um, sort of large occupational groups in the standard classification system that is used in the data. And if you look at um, changes in these groups, you don't really see much. So this seems to be sort of specific to the case of managers and, and, and not, not something that's more general. So finally, this is the second design. So now the prediction is the op opposite, right? So we're comparing firms that lost a college-educated manager to firms that lost a manager with high school or less in this plausibly exogenous setting. And the results are the opposite, as you would expect. So firms that lose the college-educated manager experience the drop in growth, and then that drop continues. Growth for the firms that lose the high school-educated manager actually goes up um, and stays there. So overall, very consistent results with the two uh, methodologies. Um, these studies only use part of the sample, right? I'm trying to generate very large increases in education, and that's why I look at the firms that switch to college-educated managers or lose them. You can actually extend this approach to the entire sample by just looking at any changes in growth and any changes in manager education. So it's the same kind of approach, but using the same sample, and this is going to give us more precise estimates. So just to go over the results quickly, if you run this regression with one-year changes in growth, you get a coefficient of 0.4, so that means that for each year of extra schooling, the firm is going to grow 0.4 percent percentage points faster per year. If you use three-year changes in growth, the result is, is basically the same. If you break down the effect by level, so that's the third column, relative to having a manager with between zero and six years of schooling, you see that each level of schooling is going to increase the rate of growth of the firm. And again, the largest jump is from the group with between 12 and 15 to the group with 15 or more, which is consistent with the pictures we saw before. And then the last two columns are just some simple robustness checks. So the fourth column adds the education of the owner. So there's an alternative story you could tell that this doesn't really have to do with management, but maybe more educated managers have more wealth. They're less subject to financial constraints, and that's why they're able to grow faster. If that was true, then it should be the education of the owner, not the manager, when they're different people. So I add the education of the owner there, and you see that it turns out not to matter. The coefficient is small and insignificant, whereas the coefficient on manager education actually goes up slightly and remains strongly significant. And then the last column just shows us uh, revenue. In instead of employment growth again, and we see that the effect also persists there and it's actually stronger. So here, as I told you, I was going to do something with heterogeneous or, or different college degrees. This is, the same, this is the coefficient on having a college degree in the exact same regression, but broken down by different types of degrees. So I think this is also quite interesting to look at. So relative to not having a college degree, 
having a degree in the humanities is going to increase the firm's growth by 1.167%. And then for business, it's substantially higher, kind of an intermediate case if you look at the entire graph, and then it's much higher for science, for engineering, and for health. So this is also suggestive. Of course, people that um, go into these degrees might not be similar ex ante, but this is also suggestive that there's, there's a technology story here at play. So the more technical degrees lead to firms that grow faster. So finally, these were all estimates based on firms changing management. Can this account for the long run relationships we saw in the data when we were looking across firms? So I take the effect from the um, management changes and I use it to simulate what the size of a firm would be at different ages um, and compare that with the actual difference in size in the data. So the first column is the simulation, the second column is the data, the third column is the ratio of the two things. And what this tells us is that the effect that we estimated from the management changes can really account for the patterns that we saw in the data before. It basically leads to firm sizes that are very, very much in line. This is comparing a, a, um, a firm with a manager that has a college degree with a firm that has a manager with a primary school degree. And you see the same differences you see in the, in the data. Finally, there's that third issue that I mentioned, which is maybe this is not really about education, but some other characteristic of the manager. Namely, the manager's ability. I'm not going to go through sort of the technical um, explanation, but the basic idea that I use is that for some managers, I observe what their income was when they were doing something else that was not working as a manager. And you can use that as a control for the manager's ability in the regression. And so basically that's the approach that I follow here. And in addition to that, I add these other characteristics of managers that I do observe in the data. So I know their age, I know how much experience they had as managers, how much experience they had in the industry that they're managing the firm in. I know the number of prior occupations that they had. This is a common variable that people in the entrepreneurship literature use to measure an entrepreneur's ability. And I use how long they've been at the firm. And so these are the results. Again, I, I won't go through them in detail, but the first column just shows the coefficient on education by itself without any controls in this sample. And then in the second column, I add this income in other occupations and the corrected education coefficient goes up slightly, but basically remains statistically the same. And then in columns three to seven, I add these different characteristics, so management experience, industry experience, prior occupations, and tenure. And you see in the first row that the coefficient on education is essentially unchanged. And then in the last two columns, I add all of these things together in one regression. And once again, the coefficient that comes out for education is very similar to the coefficient without any control. So this is consistent with this idea from the literature on individual earnings and education that bias from omitted ability and other characteristics is not a very significant issue. I find consistent results here, which suggest that it's really the education that's playing the key role. So finally, these aggregate implications. So this was all done at the level of firms. Can we now translate this to the level of the economy and what it implies? So what I do is I take the model that I use to motivate the hypothesis, I show that um, aggregate technology or TFP in this model is going to be a function of the distribution of manager education and firm age, right? Firm age because the effect is over time as the firm grows. And so this joint distribution is the key object of interest. And then I use the estimated effect that I got from the previous findings. I calibrate this model and I run simulations of what happens when you change manager education. And so as an example, I look at what happens when you move from the distribution of manager education in Portugal to that in the United States. And to measure the two things consistently, instead of using the Quadrispecial data that I used for this analysis, I'm going to use the same source to measure education in both countries. There's this survey called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which includes information on the education of entrepreneurs. 
And so I used that to measure the distribution of education or manager education in the two countries. So you get an average of 10 for Portugal, which incidentally is exactly the same that you get from Quadrupsual, which is reassuring. And in the United States, that average is 14 years of schooling. So I'm going to look at changes in the entire distribution, but if you just look at the means, that's the difference between the two countries in 2011. So I assume that the distribution of firm age is going to be independent of manager education, which is a conservative assumption. It works against finding a large result, because as I showed you, the survival of firms also increases with manager education. So I'm ignoring that channel for simplicity. And in terms of results, this is what you get. If you move from the distribution of manager education in Portugal to that of the US, aggregate TFP would increase by 33%. If you account for increased physical capital accumulation as an endogenous response to the higher productivity level, then output per capita would rise by 54%. So that's about half of the difference between the two countries. The US is about twice as um, productive or produces income twice as high as Portugal, about half of that difference in this model using these results can be accounted by manager education. Okay, so to conclude, I first started by making this point, which comes from an old theory of development, that if education is driving technology adoption, then the aggregate return to education is going to be larger than the individual return. Then I developed a micro-level test for this. So basically all the empirical work that has been done in the past of this has used aggregate tests, and those are riddled with problems. So I'm trying to use a micro-based approach. And that approach leads to the following prediction. Does firm growth increase with manager education? I then use this very rich data set from Portugal to test that, and I find strong support for that. That seems to be really the case. And furthermore, the magnitude suggests that manager education can account for these large differences in, in productivity. So what are the implications? I mean, obviously this is very good news for a country like Portugal that has invested a lot in education, right? This is telling us that the social return to education is going to be higher than many people think. We've done all this investment and this is an optimistic message. That's the good news. There's also the bad news, which is that this effect takes a very long time to play out. So if you invest in a generation's education, it takes decades for the labor force to reflect that investment. That we all know. What these results are showing in addition is that even once those people join the labor force, when they choose to start firms, it again takes decades for those firms to grow. So this really, really takes a long time. So I think we all know, and we've seen this data here today, that most of the highly developed countries in the world today, Northern Europe, the United States, Japan, made very large investments in education a very, very long time ago. And I think that's not a coincidence. If these results are true, then that's exactly what you would expect. It would take a very long time for these things to play out. So it is a very optimistic message, and I think we have reasons to be optimistic, but we also need to be very patient, I think is what the message is from these results. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have time for a few questions. Fantastic uh, paper, fantastic presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just, um, just some, uh, some questions, uh, from Francisco. You focus here most on, on firm growth measured both in terms of employment or, uh, or value added, but what about the productivity? I know that productivity is very difficult to measure at the firm level, level, level data, of course, but you, know, you could make some proxies or profitability also. No? Um, other thing is that I was a bit uh, surprised that you, uh, I, perhaps you used some controls related with the types of sectors. I'm not necessarily focusing on sectors, but on the type of competition. Market structures, you know, because uh, there are some uh, some uh, uh, some you know sectors where uh, use of technology, uh, R and D races are particularly important, right, for being successful in that market. In others, much less. So, have you con have you controlled uh, for that or not? 
And uh, my just final point is that these time effects indeed are, are, are very important. You know, the, the, the point that you mentioned about time effects are, are indeed very important and we should always keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I think uh, overall this is really good news uh, you know, for, uh, you know, for this country because uh, indeed all this investment that is done, was done in, uh, in higher education we will have certainly uh, a return, but it will take like uh, you know, 20 years or, or so. But uh, the, the problem is, is that uh, you know, we also need to be consistent with other policies. So the problem is that indeed, because this takes time to materialize, because you go through political, so political cycles, you could even run, you know, this is not a problem in, in, in Portugal currently, but there is a lot of shaking of uh, it's a political situation in, in Europe. And there could be significant setbacks in terms of policies. But you need all the other structural policies in place for these returns to materialize in this time period, so which is a bit long. So it's, it's indeed a message about patient and, uh, and uh, time consistency of policies, right? No, yeah. but, uh, very good, thank you. Okay, so let me say a few things about that. So first, the point about productivity. So this um, exercise is exactly about productivity, but as you mentioned, productivity is something that is very hard to measure at the firm level, and variations in productivity, if we measure the typical TFP residual that we use at the aggregate level, might not mean the same at the firm level. Right? And there's recent research, for instance, that interprets differences in TFP at the firm level as distortions right, that lead to misallocation. Because in standard models, the productivity of firms should be equalized when we measure it in revenue terms, which is typically how we do it. And when it's not, it might actually reflect distortions. So at the country level, productivity has, I think, a more definite interpretation than at the firm level. But if we look at different models of heterogeneous firms, I think one common prediction is that more productive firms grow more. I think that's a more uniform prediction, and that is why I focus specifically on, on, on that prediction. You can, you can replicate some of these results based on typical measures of TFP and find sort of similar patterns uh, or at least in terms of levels that the firms with more educated managers tend to also have higher measured productivity in terms of revenues. But I think that is more ambiguous to interpret in terms of the models that we use, whereas firm growth is more unambiguous. Um, the second point was about um, the heterogeneity across sectors, right? So in terms of controlling for those things, I think that when you look inside firms, you're implicitly addressing all of these issues, right? Because these are the same firms, they're not changing sectors, and so you're implicitly holding all of that constant. But still, this is an average effect across different sectors, right? I've tried to look at some heterogeneity, and honestly, I didn't find much, I was surprised. So if you look across, say, manufacturing and services, if you look at more competitive sectors, less competitive sectors, I haven't really found large differences in terms of the magnitude of the effect. I did find that in sectors where exit rates are higher, so there's more churn of firms, the effect tends to be a bit stronger. And I think that's consistent with this idea of adaptation, of technology playing a role in adaptation. So more adaptable managers are able to survive more easily. So, but that's really the only meaningful source of heterogeneity that I found. And then I forgot your third question. Oh, yes, yes, about the comment of the time and the importance of other, other, other policies. So I completely agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, one basic point that you can make, and we were talking about that today also, is to what extent can we retain these highly educated people that we train locally? And that is one example of something that is going to depend on other policies. It needs to be, Portugal needs to be, and these different regions need to be attractive places for educated people to settle down and start firms. And that's not trivial. A lot of things need to happen for this to be the case. And as labor mobility increases across Europe, I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. So I completely agree with your point. Uh, Francisco, uh, again, congratulations, very good presentation, very interesting uh, paper. Um, you showed us a lot of uh, results, and in some version of the presentation, the evidence is extremely convincing. 
come to think about it, though, I think you have a sample where something like 50% of your managers, even in 2009, have less than eight years of education. The average, the medium firm size, so 50% of your sample, yes. have less than five employees. I think the median is nine. I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Well, in the first graph that you showed, the first three basic levels added mm -hmm. up to more than 50%, so that's it. Okay. Anyway, median firm size less than five. five no, no, I meant the me oh, that too. Okay, but yeah, I mean yeah. the median education of the manager is nine. And then, and then you're telling us that you know, there's an extremely strong effect from that kind of firm, so a, a firm with four employees where the manager has five years of schooling, suddenly appoints somebody with 15 plus years of schooling, and that firm will grow a lot. You know, the assumption in the event study and in, in the different dif is basically that, the, you know, the event is exogenous. Mm -hmm. And this is anything but exogenous. You know, the firm that has four employees and the fifth employee they employ is somebody who has three times the education of the previous manager is not a random, you know. It, and, and of course, I'm sure you've done 1,000 tests behind the, the things that, that you presented. But I want to link that to the final effect that you find the aggregate, the projection of the aggregate. Of course, projection would be imperfect. But you, you said that half of the difference between the US and Portugal is on, on increasing the, the, the education of managers by four years. Yeah, and I think this is an implausibly high effect. You know, surely there must be other things. You know, there must be that, you know, let's say the US has an independent monetary policy. You know, like there's so many other things on which I would account the difference between in productivity or in, in, in sort of the size of the economy between the US and Portugal. Mm -hmm. So if this explains 50%, it leaves very little space for everything else. You know, um, how do you respond? Sure. So the first question is about causality. And I, I agree that, that that is the major issue and that is the motivation that led me to take this analysis to the micro level of firms where I think you can hold a lot more things constant, right? And when you look at within a firm, you, you do an even better job. But of course, there are concerns with selection, with more educated managers choosing the firm that has better growth prospects, right? And that's, I think, a very valid concern that you raise. So I think that the best answer that I have is not the first picture that I showed you with changes. It's the second one that uses these firms that lose managers with different levels of education. I think that addresses that concern most directly because these are people that are disappearing from the labor force when, when they're young, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to tell a story where this, well, it's not impossible, it's, not, it's harder to tell a story where this is driven by what is happening at the firm, right? These are people that are young, they disappear from the labor force, and then I compare firms that lose people with different levels of education. I think in terms of identification and addressing causality issues, that is the most convincing result that I have and that I think addresses, in my opinion, the issue. The second issue about the result being implausibly large and driven, you know, that the difference is actually driven by other things. So I think, you know, I, at some level I agree with you. The result is surprisingly large. Um, but the benefit of doing this at the micro level again is that the estimate is really holding all of those variables that you mentioned constant, right? You know, the monetary policy and the institutions and all of that those things are held constant when you're looking within a firm. So the benefit of doing this at this level is that precisely you can hold all of those things constant and then this is the effect that comes out. Now obviously you need assumptions to go from the micro level to the macro level. So it's not, you know, in that sense, a bulletproof strategy and there are assumptions that I have to make to extrapolate this effect, right? But I think the benefit of this analysis and the way that it complements existing research is precisely that the identification is much more solid, right? So if it's implausibly large or not, I don't know. I, it's, 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 I, I leave it up to you to, to, to make your judgment call. I think the contribution here is it's a very well, or it's a well-identified micro effect extrapolated to the macro effect, holding a lot of the things you said constant. 